Hey, what's up, Unbroken Nation? Hope that you're having an amazing day wherever you are in the world. I'm very excited to be back with you with another episode with my guest, Paul Gilmartin, who is the host of the Mental Illness Happy Hour podcast and one of my personal favorite people in the mental health space today. Paul, my friend, how are you? I'm good, Michael. And uh, I, I, it's nice to be on and, and to reconnect with you. Um, if your listeners don't know, um, you, Michael was a, a guest on my podcast recently and crushed it. <laughs> <laughs> It was so I, good. It was I so appreciate good. That. Yeah. You, you know, Paul, for, for those of the unbroken nation listening, who don't know, it's actually, it was a seven year goal in the making for me to come and be a guest on your show. I remember the first time I heard it, I was like, one day I'm going to be on that show. Yeah. And, um, and you know, I think that there's something to be said about diligence, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> that said, Paul, for those who don't know you, tell us a little bit about you, your background and, and how you got to where you are today. Uh, well, my background is in uh, performing, uh, specifically stand-up and, and TV hosting, and I started doing the podcast in 2011 uh, after I went off my meds and my depression fooled me, and I got suicidal, um, and I thought, man, a podcast talking about mental health would be a good thing, because at that time, there really weren't any that that I was aware of. I'm sure there were some here and there, but um, I, I just thought having a background in comedy and knowing a lot of people from support groups and comedians who are a you know, nutty bunch to begin with, I thought you know maybe we could have something that would be compelling to listen to and I could be a cheerleader for people getting professional help or opening up to friends. And so I've been doing this full-time since, since 2011. Um, I still perform occasionally. I do satire here and there, but that's pretty much it. I was raised uh, one of two kids in a, the suburbs of Chicago, um, was a theater major in college. Uh, something in me snapped my junior year of college, and I went from pre-med to theater, which was a fun phone call home. But my parents were, were supportive, you know, for all their flaws and, and mistakes. My parents have always been supportive of me uh, pursuing a, a creative life. That's so really fascinating. Yeah. And, and one of the things I, I think about, too, is and, and I think this might be an interesting place for us to jump off this conversation is, you know, looking at the fact that, yes, our parents are very flawed, but there is sometimes that silver lining. Yeah. When, when you were growing up, I'd, I'd love, depending on your comfort level, for you to share a little bit of your experiences and, and ultimately looking at the, the trajectory of your life that have led you to where you are. Well, uh, a lot of this stuff that I think kind of left their scars or, you know, issues that I struggle with, I was not really aware of as a kid. As you know, for a lot of kids, it's their normal. They don't know what's appropriate or inappropriate. Uh, my dad was a uh, high functioning alcoholic. Uh, I never saw him slur his words until I think I was in my mid twenties and he came home from a business trip and was slightly slurring his words. But um, that, that surprised me when my mom told me when I was 18, oh yeah, your father's an alcoholic. He keeps vodka hidden around the house. And, uh, and, my, and my father did make a suicide attempt when he bottomed out on alcohol. Um, I suppose, I think I was in my late twenties. Uh, my mom was, was and is somebody who doesn't have a lot of boundaries. And she, the, the, the term covert incest um, it's kind of a broad term and it's, you know, the incesting of a child, uh, that doesn't have to do with touching their, their genitals, but it's sexualizing them, spousifying them. Um, you know, essentially the, the, the parent in a lot of ways, putting their needs a, a ahead of the child's, but, um, objectifying the child, uh, there's a lot of really inappropriate shit that, something in my gut at the time told me it was wrong. And I remember consciously putting it out of my brain. Like when I was eight, my mom was still taking my temperature rectally. And I remember thinking this feels really fucking weird. And I asked her what, you know, why are we still doing it this way? And she's like, because I'm afraid you're going to bite down on the thermometer. And I remember thinking, no, you're not, you're getting something out of this, but we just push shit out of our, our minds to survive. And there was a bunch of 
other stuff that, you know, kind of fits that, that pattern. And it really wasn't until um, I got into a support group. I've been sober about six years from drugs and alcohol, but I got into a support group for my struggles with intimacy and trust. And lo and behold, I found out a lot of them were related to um, being raised in an environment that while it was financially functioning and I knew I was loved, there was also some sick love and some abandonment issues. And um, so that that's kind of been the, the struggle, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I, I appreciate your vulnerability because I actually relate to that a ton. I have been shared in depth all of my story, but a lot of it, which I have, is around that and looking at the emotional incest in my life from from my mother and the way that she parented and the way that, you know, with between my brothers and I, it was always this like battle for attention and love and affection, mm -hmm. which then would later on lead down to these support groups where I'm like, oh shit, that's why, because of the experience that I had when I was seven and she was laying in bed naked to next to me while like I'm watching a movie. I'm like, well, that seems weird, but I guess that's just my house. And being in these support groups was, was such this beautiful experience of really being able to understand like, oh wait, shit. I'm not the only one who had crazy stuff happen as a child. Yeah. You mean there's more than just me here. And so I think that it's really powerful, Paul, that you'd be willing to share that. One of the things that I'm, I'm curious about is, so in this journey and as you're going through this, and this is a topic and, and, and I'd love to dive into it a little bit more with you, that really is not discussed that frequently. And that is this idea about emotional incest. Mm -hmm. I remember I read, I read The Truth by Neil Strauss. I don't know if you've ever read this book before. It's probably, oh gosh, I want to say eight years ago when I first read it. And he was talking about the, emo the like reality of emotional incest with the impact of his mother and his relationship. And I just picked up so many markers in that. And I thought to myself, it's very interesting that this is a conversation that, that especially men don't have. And, and as two men here in the conversation, and yes, of course, the Unbroken Nation is full of amazing women and however you identify that are listening to this show. But what you talked about the impact of this on intimacy. And now I know something personal about you now being in a very healthy, happy relationship, but what's that journey been like for you Oof. going through that discovery, learning intimacy, learning vulnerability? A lot of two steps forward, one step back. Um, a lot of, of struggles to uh, be kind to myself, to practice self-care. Uh, two of the things that I discovered in my support group that are common artifacts of experiencing incest is to, to struggle with self-care and, um, you know, to uh, perfectionism. I would say, uh, is, is the best way to put it. Feeling like if we don't do something right, we're not going to be loved, you know, that we have to be everything to, to everybody, kind of an all or nothing, you know, either I'm the life of the party or I've shut the door and I don't want anybody, you know, bothering me. And, and same with sexuality, either really promiscuous or sometimes in a relationship completely shut down and, and, um, uh, you know, those are, those are some of the, the things, um, difficulty with recognizing other people's boundaries, difficulty setting boundaries for myself, difficulty saying no, um, because it, it, um, the environment I was raised in, you know, at seven, I became my mom's therapist, you know, her breaking down and crying about her marriage and how she wanted to leave us because we were selfish bastards. And my dad was selfish. And, and I remember feeling like it was up to me to keep her happy. And I'm sure my sense of humor in some way, uh, was derived from that survival need to release tension in the family. Um, you know, and that being said, there were some great things about, about my mom. Um, she was easily the, the, the most, um, racially sensitive person uh, in our neighborhood. Um, she showed us how other people lived. 
you know, she would take us to the, to the inner city sometimes and say, you know, everybody doesn't, isn't as fortunate as, as we are to have what we have. And it wasn't to shame us. It was just to open our eyes to the, the greater world. Um, she's always supported me doing creative things. So I think like a lot of people, it's a really complicated relationship and it's not all good or all bad. It's just mixed. And that can be one of the hurdles in recovering is because there's a part of you that feels like, well, if I attach any, any negative uh, feelings to the things I went through, I'm calling my mom a bad person. No, you're not. I had an epiphany one day that giving weight to what happened to me wasn't to punish my mom. It was to help me stop punishing myself. Powerful. When you, when you stop punishing yourself, I want to go in this a little bit deeper. Cause I, I know that there are people listening right now who are like, holy shit, I've never thought that before. Cause I think that is epiphany that in, a, in epiphany that you only discover through doing the work. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know how else those moments come in that stop punishing yourself. How did that conversation with you intertwine in the way that it played out in all of the relationships of your life? The, and before I answer that question, I want to plug a book uh, about covert incest. And the, the term was coined by the, the author. His name is uh, Kenneth Adams. And the book is called Silently Seduced. I highly recommend it I to uh, anybody who feels like they had a relationship with a parent that, you know, kind of crossed uh, boundaries. Um, so how did I, how did I, uh, begin to, let's start with how did I begin to tolerate myself? You know, uh, I remember very clearly I was in a workshop for my support group and, and we were going around the table. There was only like six of us and we all happened to be sharing on our self-loathing. And if you looked at these people that I was in the room with, you know, they were attractive, successful, seemed to have their shit together. And, and I suddenly had this feeling that God hadn't just tolerated me my entire life or the universe, whatever you want to call it. But maybe there was a path for me that had been predetermined because the universe, God, whatever, thought that I could fulfill this role well and that I was special, not better than anybody, just special in my own way. And I felt love from something out there in the universe come into my heart. And I started crying like tears of joy that I wasn't a mistake. I wasn't dirty. I wasn't broken. I was given a gift and I could choose. And, and that gift was um, difficulty in childhood and scars and struggles. And there could be a silver lining to it. I know you're a, a big believer in, in silver linings and my job was to just keep plugging forward and to be kind to myself as I made mistakes along the way. I, you know, my recovery has been so ungraceful, so nonlinear. And those are opportunities for me to dust myself off and say, I'm going to do better next time. Let's not shame ourselves. Let's just make a note of where I stumbled to try to not do it again. Because another epiphany I had was nobody ever shamed themselves into being the person they wanted to be. And I used to think that shame was discipline and discipline was good. It's not. It's not. It can keep us frozen. Um, I think shame, shame is one of the most toxic emotions that we can feel because it keeps us small. Or even worse, it, 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 we begin to project and to try to shame other people to feel bigger, to not feel small. I mean, look at social media. It's filled with people trying to shame each other so they can 
feel better. And I played that game for a while. And I just one day went, this is insane. Me trying to change people's view on Facebook or, you know, cut them with some type of joke uh, because it feels better for me to humiliate them. That, that, that's not going to make me feel better, but that's how I was dealing with shame. And, and, and one of the things that I found that I had to do is I had to surrender to the fact that I'm powerless over what other people do, say, and think, including what they say or think about me. And, and that's so hard. Much. Look, man, I think like no bullshit. I think that's the fucking secret to life. Like I, I really truly do because until that moment, you're in my parent, my experience, I won't put words in your mouth, but until the moment where I realized that I didn't have to give a shit about how people thought about who I am is where I found freedom mm -hmm. because the only thing I'd ever done as a kid was I will bend at all angles to make sure that you like me. Yeah. Cause it's safety. It's a defensive mechanism. A lot of that came from favoritism. My mom showed like, she was like, Oh, which boy behaves the best gets to go to dinner tonight or to the movie. Yeah. When we, when we went to like the dollar movie or to like Applebee's with a coupon. And, and that played this really devastating role in my life for a long time. And, and I, I tell my clients when I coach them, people listen to this show, the unbroken nation, they know like, when you can get to that place in life where you stop giving a shit about people's opinion of you, everything becomes different. And for me, it was like a light bulb moment. And I'm, I'm wondering if that's how it felt for you too, mm -hmm. if this was another epiphany in this journey. Yeah. The, the, one of the things that really helped me let go of what other people thought of me, obviously was me being kinder to myself and viewing myself less negatively. Because, you know, when somebody views us negatively and we haven't done any work on ourselves, we're there just reconfirming our worst fears and thoughts about ourselves. And boy, the anger that that ignites is so all consuming. Uh, but once I was able in my support groups to work through my flaws, and it's not like my flaws have disappeared, but I'm more aware of them now. And I have tools to deal with when, when feelings come up that I used to, you know, lash out at people or, you know, get high to, to not deal with it. When those feelings come up nowadays, I, nowadays I reach for a, a, a tool that's more compassionate towards myself. So when I see people acting in a way that I want to judge, I try to remember, man, I'm just like them. I've made mistakes. I've hurt people. I'm no better than they are. I might just be at a different place on the path than them. And me having compassion for them doesn't mean I'm going to allow them into my life. But I don't have to hate them. I, I kind of view them as, a, as, a, as a, an abused dog that bites. It doesn't know any better. It's afraid. And there's nothing wrong with not going into the yard of the dog that bites. And, and my mom is, you know, a dog that bites. And I had to cut contact with her. I have love for her, but I had to salvage my, my mental health. So um, did that answer your question? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that when I look at my, my experience, and again, just a, another incredible parallel that you and I have, you know, I cut contact with my mother at 18. I, I just foresaw the future. I knew that if I did not, I would not. There's Paul, there's no fucking way I'd be talking to you today if my mother would have stayed in my life. Yeah. And I think that's one of the most empowering and sad experiences of my life yes. is being willing to do that. Because my, my mother had redeeming qualities, like my love for music and film and, you know, my ability to do a lot of things that I do, like she would make me go sing in elementary pageants in front of all the kids as like the lead guy. And like, that's played a role in me being on stages in front of tens of thousands of people. But that doesn't mean that she didn't do bad things. And, right. and to your point, which I, I would love to parlay for a second, I tell people all the time, I have fucked up. I will fuck up again. I just, it's inevitability because we're having this thing called a human experience. But 
operating through kindness is everything. And if you can be the kind of person who is kind to yourself, then when those moments come, instead of destroying yourself, you do exactly what you just said, Paul, you go, what can I learn from this? Yes. How and who do I need to different? apologize to? You know, Talk is there somebody I, is there, is there somebody I need to make something right with? Um, that's been a big part of me feeling better about myself has been, you know, I need to call that person up and apologize. Cause, uh, you know, the, I thought that joke was funny when I made fun of them in front of that group of people, but I could see that they were hurt when I, when I did that. And that's something that wasn't even on my radar and, until, you know, maybe 15 years ago that, that I used my sense of humor, uh, aggressively and to make myself feel better than other people, you know, and it's not like that, that it's bad to bust balls when you're with your friends, but you know, when something's appropriate and, and when it's not. Um, so being aware of, um, my flaws and my tendencies and my bad coping mechanisms, uh, has been, has been huge for me, not only to help me slowly become the person I want to be, but to have compassion for other people. That's beautiful. And what I'm curious about is, so I look at these experiences that I have when you go, yeah, shit, I fucked up. I did the thing I said I wasn't going to do. I, I, I went, I made fun of the person I shouldn't have made fun of in a way that wasn't fun. Right. Cause like, I'm all about it. Like if you can't talk shit, like you're going to trouble life is difficult. You got to be able to handle a little bit of it. Right. But when you're like, you have that moment and you look at the experience of whatever it is that you've done and you're like, fuck, this is outside of my values, outside of my moral yeah. character, outside of who it is that I'm a, as a person, two parts to this one, how do you reconcile that? And then two, what would you tell people who just destroy themselves when they fuck up? Ask yourself when you're, when you're just savaging yourself, ask yourself, would I say this to my best friend? Then why would you say it to yourself? You are uniquely positioned to be your own best friend throughout your life. Why would you be the meanest voice in your life? Because it is not going to discipline you. It's, it's probably going to keep you acting from a place of fear rather than a place of abundance and peace. For me, I had to let go of all the coping mechanisms that I thought were going to bring me power, prestige, popularity, whatever you want to call it. They weren't working. And I had to by get, having to get help from my drinking and drugging, I found myself surrounded by like-minded people who wanted the best for me. And I felt unconditional love, no strings attached. Uh, not with everybody in those groups, but with enough people that I felt a part of something bigger than myself. And it was then that I began to feel filled up, that I began to go, well, if these dozen people that I hang with all the time tell me they love me, help me when I need help, are there for me, why can't I do that for myself? Um, and I also had to start being helpful to other people. That really, you know, they, there's a saying, I'm sure you've heard in support groups, if you want to improve your self-esteem, do esteemable acts. Um, one of my friends has a, has a saying, uh, service begins where convenience ends. But I, you know, the, the addict part of my brain never wants to be of service. I want to sit by myself and think about myself, look into my broken crystal ball and try to predict the future so that I can have enough money to survive. Yeah. The, the addict part of me likes to sit on the couch, get stoned and play video games nonstop. Yeah. Nonstop. There's nothing more fun. You know, here's, what's really funny is like for a long time. And, and I even kind of like tossed the coin on how I feel about this. 
you know, going, okay, what does addiction really mean? And am I an addict and looking at my life and having the ebb and flows, but like legit being addicted to video games as a kid and in my teens and in my early twenties where there was a game. Oh my God, I'm going to, I'm going to put this out here. There's a game called Diablo two that came out in, I think 2003. By the time that I stopped playing that, it's one of the only video games I played for almost a decade straight. By the time I finished playing it, I had logged over 1,400 hours. 1,400 hours. And that's the thing that's so fascinating because when you make the decision and the declaration to create change in your life, inevitably over time, change will come. Now, if I sit down and play a video game, like I can maybe play for like 20 minutes and I'm bored out of my mind, but it took this act of service, right? Despite the addiction, despite not wanting to do it, me showing up every day, being committed to conversations like this, mm -hmm. to being of value to the world that changed who I am today. One of the things I want to dive in a little bit deeper with you that you said that I, I actually kind of want to push you on a little bit, just in terms of language to pull something out here. You said that you found yourself with these group of empowering people. Mm -hmm. What I believe, Paul, is that you put yourself in those groups. I, I feel like you didn't I did. get miracled did. into them. Right. Uh, I think th there's a part of me that because it feels like such a perfect fit, that there is kind of a miracle predestiny, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, I just wanted to not kill myself. <laughs> That's how low my bar was for, you know, going and getting help for my drinking and, and drugging. I just knew I was going to kill myself, uh, either through suicide or, you know, uh, ruining my life. Uh, so, one of the one of the keys was to progress and to help myself i had to learn how to get vulnerable i had to be willing to talk about the ugly parts of me the things i was going to take to the grave the womanizing the cheating on my then wife uh things that i felt shame about uh and that helped me realize that what people really appreciate in each other is truth. They're not looking for perfection. They're looking for truth and mutual respect. Yeah. And I found it there. I found truth and laughter. And it's like, that's my fucking drug. And I never OD on truth and laughter. Uh, and and I will say this, as someone who has listened to hundreds of episodes of your your podcast, like I know that to be true. You know, I, I look at my life and my experiences and so many of the people who have reached out to me over the years, so many people have coached, so many people who are like trying to make their life better. And there always seems to be this like moment of, I, I want to call it clarity. And, and what I mean by that, it's kind of that moment of that lead up to before the worst case scenario happens where you shift your life, dare I call it the rock bottom what happened in your life that caused you to like, let, let me preface it with this. And, and if I'm wrong, please. I believe that subconsciously, we all know what we're supposed to be doing. However, it takes a catalyst or a stimulus for us to actually move towards what that thing was or is. And so what I, what I'd love to know, Paul is like, did you have that moment? Was there a catalyst for massive change in your life? And, and what has been the biggest difference about the understanding of who you believe you are since that moment? Well, the original catalyst was not wanting to commit suicide. Um, I could see that my life on paper was great. I was hosting this TV show. I was making good money. I had time to spend it. I had my health, my physical health, my friends. Why was I thinking about killing myself 50 times a day? Well, I can look back now and say it's because my spirit was dead, but because all I cared about was myself. Mm. Like, um, I wasn't feeding my spirit. Uh, the second epiphany or launching point was the fear of living the rest of my life without knowing true intimacy in a 
in a relationship. I could have intimacy in platonic relationships with people, but when it came to romantic relationships, I just, you can only get so close. And, you know, I was able to realize, oh, you know, it's probably related to my mom overwhelming me with her needs and a fear of being suffocated. And I, you know, I learned that, well, that, the, the tool isn't putting up an iron wall to keep you away from everybody. It's getting better at understanding who you open the door for and how much you open the door. And it's a lot of trial and error. And so today I don't allow toxic people in my lives, in my life. And uh, that's, that's been huge for me. So those were the two big catalysts in, in changing. Um, but I, you know, I had to be looking into a deep, dark hole to be willing to do the work to do that because I don't like doing work. <laughs> and I don't like going back into the icky, the icky memories, the icky feelings, the shame of ways that I've acted. But it's been necessary for me to begin to put together a little bit of humility and to begin to be willing to do the, the, the reading and the writing and, you know, to read books, a therapist suggests, you know, um, to share my secrets with somebody in my support group. In that, I, I hear massive, massive vulnerability. And I would argue that it's probably the most important trait that one develops I will say that I do not believe it's inherent to people who come from traumatic backgrounds. No, no. <laughs> but telling people that come from trauma to be vulnerable is like saying to a person that's just run out of a burning building, the very thing you need is back in that burning building. <laughs> that is the greatest fucking analogy I've ever heard in my life. Yes, you're spot on. Paul, what, for the people who are listening to this and they're just like, besides themselves in this moment, because I'm one of them in real time having this conversation. And they're like, okay, what do I do? Like, what do I really do? Like, I, I hear these guys are talking. This has gone through my head a million times. I'm fucking suicidal. Life feels like a disaster. Like, what do they do, Paul? Where, where do you start? Well, if you are actively suicidal, and you feel like you're making a plan or on the verge of making a plan, please call the suicide hotline. Um, do not reach out to a non-professional as your sole source um, of, of support because you won't get the full help that you need. And it's not fair to them to feel like they've got to keep you alive. That's a lot to put on somebody. That doesn't mean you're a burden. It just means that you, uh, you deserve a larger support network. Um, the very thing that you struggle over and the thing that you want to hide is probably the very thing that is going to connect you to your next group of close friends. And there is trial and error in it. What's really important is to just keep going, to just keep trying different things. I have tried so many things in the last 20 years. I probably tried 25 different meds, you know, my psychiatrist finally, we were able to dial in uh, a combination of meds that, that works for me. This is the first fall in God knows how long that my depression you know, hasn't felt like Elvis entering a stadium. Uh, the Hope is so hard when you've been kicked in the teeth a lot of times, when you've had failure after failure after failure. But being around as long as I've been, I'm almost 60, I'm 59 years old, I can tell you the greatest things in my life wouldn't have happened if I hadn't experienced failure previous to it. Yeah. And I'm right there with you. And every time I fail, I just look at my life and go, cool. I learned a lesson. 
And I've tried all the modalities, you name it, I've tried it. I spent all the money, I did all the things. And, and I am going to wholeheartedly agree with you that if you can do that thing, whatever it is that you need to do to give yourself the strength to face your fear of just going one more day, mm -hmm. tomorrow might be the day everything's different. Mm -hmm. like Sharon Lecter, who is an entrepreneur, she co-wrote multiple books, but she has a book called Three Feet from Gold. And the idea of that book is very simple. You might be three feet from that thing that you've always wanted. One more day, one more minute, one more action. And I think that's the reality of life. Like if you, you find that reason to keep going, which for me has been being of service, right? You find that thing, being a better brother, being a better communicator, a leader, a speaker, all those things. And for you, it may be, you know, being a better mom, being the best entrepreneur or business owner or whatever that thing is. But finding that reason to hold on will forever change everything for you. And as someone who's attempted suicide myself, I can tell you right now, like the greatest moment of my life was like being able to come through the other side of that. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's not fucking hard because it's hard. Some days suck. Some days I don't want to do this. Some days I want to lay in bed and fucking mm -hmm. eat chocolate cake and do nothing. Yeah. But I ask myself, who do I need to be today? And if I were a person who's kind to myself, what would I need to do? One of the reasons why, and thank you for sharing that, and, and I agree wholeheartedly. And one of the things that I would have never imagined I would get out of support groups is other people seeing the change in me before I could see it myself. And them helping me to see myself through their eyes. Um, a psychiatrist, after I cut contact with my mom, um, which is a, a very long process and not simple and the most painful thing I've probably ever been through. My psych psychiatrist said to me, I just want to commend you on looking into the jaws of the monster. He said, so many people run from that monster, that the monster of childhood trauma without ever stopping to heal, you know, your feelings won't kill you, but running from them might. Yeah, they might. And so I, I hope that for folks listening, you're, you're willing to step into what's next in your life because anything is fucking possible. I promise you as a dude sitting here having this conversation, I know it to be true. And I don't believe I'm in any way special. I just believe that if I keep going, I will get to where I want to go. Yeah. Paul, this conversation has been absolutely incredible, my friend. Before I ask you my last question, can you tell everyone where they can find you? Uh, yeah, the uh, podcast is called The Mental Illness Happy Hour, and the website for it is mentalpod.com. And mentalpod is also the social media handle you can follow me at on Twitter and Instagram. Brilliant. And of course, we'll put all those links in the show notes personally. Just a little bit of shout out. It is my favorite mental health show, so I am being biased, um, but it is a phenomenal show. You have amazing guests with amazing stories. Paul, my last question for you, my friend, what does it mean to you to be unbroken? To keep seeking. You know, because I used to think of myself as broken and I now think of myself as scarred you know, wounded. And we, we can heal. I believe that, that we can heal. Because if I think of things as broken, then what's the point of putting effort in? Uh, and it's in the process of seeking that I found not only the answers to questions that I had, but questions that I, that I didn't even know I had. It's very beautiful. And as, as Hemingway said, life breaks many of us, but for some of us, we're stronger in the broken places. Yeah, Paul, thank that. you for being here. Unbroken Nation, thank you so much for listening. Please like, subscribe, comment, share, tell a friend. And until next time, my friends, be unbroken. I'll see you.